Section 22 of A Popular History of France, Volume 5. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 38. Louis XIII, Cardinal Richelieu and the Court, 1622-1642, Part 3. It was against Marshal Schomberg that Montmorency was advancing. The latter found himself isolated in his revolt, shut up within the limits of his government, between the two armies of the king, who was marching in person against him. Calculations had been based upon an uprising of several provinces and the adhesion of several governors, amongst others of the aged Duke of Epernon, who had sent to Monsieur to say, quote, I am his very humble servant, let him place himself in a position to be served, end quote but no one moved. The king every day received fresh protestations of fidelity, and the Duke of Epernon had repaired to Montauban to keep that restless city to its duty, and to prevent any attempt from being made in the province. At three leagues' distance from Castelnaudary, Marshal Schomberg was besieging a castle called Saint-Félix de Carmin, which held out for the Duke of Orléans. Montmorency advanced to the aid of the place. He had two thousand foot and three thousand horse, and the Duke of Orléans accompanied him with a large number of gentlemen. The marshal had won over the defenders of Saint-Félix, and he was just half a league from Cassonaudery when he encountered the rebel army. The battle began almost at once. Count de Moret, natural son of Henry IV, and Jacqueline de Buil, fired the first shot. Hearing the noise, Montmorency, who commanded the right wing, takes a squadron of cavalry and, quote, urged on by that impetuosity which takes possession of all brave men at the like juncture, he spurs his horse forward, leaps the ditch which was across the road, rides over the musketeers, and the mishap of finding himself alone causing him to feel more indignation than fear, he makes up his mind to signalize by his resistance a death which he cannot avoid, end quote. Only a few gentlemen had followed him, amongst others an old officer named Count de Rieux, who had promised to die at his feet, and he kept his word. In vain had Montmorency called to him his men-at-arms and the regiment of Ventadour. The rest of the cavalry did not budge. Count de Moret had been killed. Terror was everywhere taking possession of the men. The duke was engaged with the king's light horse. He had just received two bullets in his mouth his horse quote, a small barb extremely swift end quote, came down with him and he fell wounded in seventeen places alone without a single squire to help him a sergeant of a company of the guards saw him fall and carried him into the road some soldiers who were present burst out crying they seemed to be lamenting their generals rather than their prisoners misfortune Montmorency alone remained as if insensible to the blows of adversity, and testified by the grandeur of his courage that, quote, in him it had its seat in a place higher than the heart, end quote. Journal du Duc de Montmorency, Archive Curieuse de l'Histoire de France. Whilst the army of the Duke of Orléans was retiring, carrying off their dead, nearly all of the highest rank, the king's men were bearing away Montmorency, mortally wounded, to Castelnaudary. His wife, Mary Felicia des Ursins, daughter of the Duke of Bracciano, being ill in bed at Béziers, sent him a doctor, together with her equerry, to learn the truth about her husband's condition. Quote, thou tell my wife, said the Duke, the number and greatness of the wounds thou hast seen, and thou'lt assure her that it which I have caused her spirit is incomparably more painful to me than all the others. End quote. On passing through the faubourg of the town, the duke desired that his litter should be opened, quote, and the serenity that shone through the pallor of his visage moved the feelings of all present, and forced tears from the stoutest and the most stolid. End quote. Journal du Duc de Montmorency, Archive Curieuse de l'Histoire de France. The Duke of Orleans did not lack the courage of the soldier. He would fain have rescued Montmorency and sought to rally his forces, but the troops of Languedoc would obey none but the governor. The foreigners mutinied, and the king's brother had no longer an army. Quote, Next day, when it was too late, says Richelieu, Monsieur sent a trumpeter to demand battle of Marshal Schomberg, who replied that he would not give it, but that, if he met him, he would try to defend himself against him. End quote. Monsieur considered himself absolved from seeking the combat, and henceforth busied himself about nothing but negotiation. Albi, Bézier, and Pézena hastened to give in their submission. It was necessary for the Duchess of Montmorency, ill and in despair, to quicken her departure from Béziers, where she was no longer safe. Quote, 
as she passed along the streets she heard nothing but a confusion of voices amongst the people speaking insolently of those who would withdraw in apprehension end quote. the king was already at lyons he was at pont saint esprit when he sent a message to his brother from whom he had already received emissaries on the road the first demands of gaston d'orleans were still proud he required the release of montmorency the rehabilitation of all those who had served his party and his mother's places of surety and money the king took no notice and a second envoy from the prince was put in prison meanwhile the superintendent of finance m de bouillon had reached him from the king and quote, found the mind of monsieur very penitent and well disposed but not that of all the rest for monsieur confessed that he had been ill-advised to behave as he did at the cardinal's house and afterwards leave the court acknowledging himself to be much obliged to the king for the clemency he had shown to him in his proclamation which had touched him to the heart and that he was bounden therefore to the cardinal whom he had always liked and esteemed and believed that he also on his side liked him memoire de richelieu page one ninety six the duchess of montmorency knew monsieur although she it was said had pressed her husband to join him and all ill as she was had been following him ever since the battle of castelnaudary in the fear lest he should forget her husband in the treaty she could not unfortunately enter beziers and it was there that the arrangements were concluded monsieur protested his repentance cursing in particular father chateloub confessor and confidant of the queen his mother quote, whom he wished the king would have hanged he had given pretty counsel to the queen causing her to leave the kingdom for all the great hopes he had led her to conceive she was reduced to relieve her weariness by praying to god memoire de richelieu page one ninety six as for monsieur he was ready to give up all intelligence with spain lorraine and the queen his mother quote, who could negotiate her business herself end quote. he bound himself to take no interest quote, in him or those who had connected themselves with him on these occasions for their own purposes and he would not complain should the king make them suffer what they had deserved end quote it is true that he added to these base concessions many entreaties in favour of m de montmorency but m de bouillon did not permit him to be under any delusion quote, it is for your highness to choose he said whether or not you prefer to cling to the interests of m de montmorency displease the king and lose his good graces End quote. the prince signed everything then he set out for tours which the king had assigned for his residence receiving on the way from town to town all the honours that would have been paid to his majesty himself m de montmorency remained in prison Quote, he awaited death with a resignation which is inconceivable says the author of his memoir never did man speak more boldly than he about it it seemed as if he were recounting another's perils when he described his own to his servants and his guards who were the only witnesses of such lofty manliness his sister the princess of cond had a memorial prepared for his defence put before him he read it carefully then he tore it up quote, having always determined he said not to chicaner or go pettifogging for or dispute his life quote, i ought by rights to answer before the parliament of paris only said he to the commission of the parliament of toulouse instructed to conduct his trial but i give up with all my heart this privilege and all others that might delay my sentence End quote. there was not long to wait for the decree on arriving at toulouse october twenty seven at noon the duke had asked for a confessor quote, father said he to the priest i pray you to put me this moment in the shortest and most certain path to heaven that you can having nothing more to hope or wish for but god end quote. all his family had hurried up but without being able to obtain the favour of seeing the king quote, his majesty had strengthened himself in the resolution he had taken from the first to make in the case of the said sieur de montmorency a just example for all the grandees of his kingdom in the future as the late king his father had done in the person of marshal de biron says richelieu in his memoir the princess of cond could not gain admittance to his majesty who lent no ear to the supplications of his oldest servants represented by the aged duke of epernon who accused himself by his own mouth of having but lately committed the same crime as the duke of montmorency quote, you can retire duke was all that louis the thirteenth deigned to reply quote, i should not be a king if i had not the feelings of private persons said he to marshal chatillon who pointed out to him the downcast looks and swollen eyes of all his court it was the thirtieth of october early and the duke of montmorency was sleeping peacefully his confessor came and awoke him quote, surgit yamus 
or rise let us be going he said as he awoke and when his surgeon would have dressed his wounds quote, now is the time to heal all my wounds with a single one he said and he had himself dressed in the clothes of white linen he had ordered to be made at lectour for the day of execution when the last questions were put to him by the judges he answered by a complete confession and when the decree was made known to him quote, i thank you gentlemen said he to the commissioners and i beg you to tell all them of your body from me that i hold this decree of the king's justice for a decree of god's mercy End quote. he walked to the scaffold with the same tranquillity saluting right and left those whom he knew to take leave of them then having with difficulty placed himself upon the block so much did his wounds still cause him to suffer he said out loud quote, domine jesu accipe spiritum meum or lord jesus receive my spirit End quote. as his head fell the people rushed forward to catch his blood and dip their handkerchiefs in it henry de montmorency was the last of the ducal branch of his house and was only thirty-seven it was a fine opportunity for monsieur to once more break his engagements shame and anxiety drove him equally he was universally reproached with montmorency's death and he was by no means easy on the subject of his marriage of which no mention had been made in the arrangements he quitted tours and withdrew to flanders writing to the king to complain of the duke's execution saying that the life of the latter had been the tacit condition of his agreement and that his promise being thus not binding he was about to seek a secure retreat out of the kingdom Quote, everybody knows in what plight you were brother and whether you could have done anything else replied the king Quote, what think you, gentlemen, was it that lost the Duke of Montmorency his head? said Cardinal Zapata to Bautru and Barreau, envoys of France, whom he met in the antechamber of the King of Spain. Quote, his crimes, replied Bautru. Quote, no, said the Cardinal, but the clemency of His Majesty's predecessors. End quote. Louis the Thirteenth and Cardinal Richelieu have assuredly not merited that reproach in history so many and such terrible examples were at last to win the all-powerful minister some years of repose once only in sixteen thirty six a new plot on the part of monsieur and the count of soissons threatened not only his power but his life the king's headquarters were established at the castle of desmoins and the princes urged on by montresor and saint ibal had resolved to compass the cardinal's death the blow was to be struck at the exit from the council richelieu conducted the king back to the bottom of the staircase the two gentlemen were awaiting the signal but monsieur did not budge and retired without saying a word the count of soissons dared not go any further and the cardinal mounted quietly to his own rooms without dreaming of the extreme peril he had run richelieu was rather lofty than proud and too clear-sighted to mistake the king's feelings towards him Never did he feel any confidence in his position, and never did he depart from his jealous and sometimes petty watchfulness. Any influence foreign to his own disquieted him in proximity to a master whose affairs he governed altogether, without ever having been able to get the mastery over his melancholy and singular mind. Women filled but a small space in the life of Louis the Thirteenth. Twice, however, in that interval of ten years which separated the plot of Montmorency from that of saint Mars, did the minister believe himself to be threatened by feminine influence, and twice he used artifice to win the monarch's heart and confidence from two young girls of his court, Louise de Lafayette and Marie d'Autefort. Both were maids of honour to the queen. Mademoiselle d'Autefort was fourteen years old when, in 1630, at Lyon, in the languors of convalescence, the king first remarked her blooming and at the same time severe beauty, and her air of nobility and modesty. And it was not long before the whole court knew that he had remarked her, for his first care at the sermon was to send the young maid of honour the velvet cushion on which he knelt for her to sit upon. Mademoiselle d'Autefort declined it, and remained seated, like her companions, on the ground but henceforth the courtier's eyes were riveted on her movements on the interminable conversations in which she was detained by the king on his jealousies his tiffs and his reconciliations after their quarrels the king would pass the greater part of the day in writing out what he had said to mademoiselle d'autefort and what she had replied to him at his death his desk was found full of these singular reports of the most innocent but almost most stormy and most troublesome love affair that ever was the king was especially jealous of mademoiselle d'autefort's passionate devotion to the queen her mistress anne of austria quote, you love an ingrate he said and you will see how she will repay your services End quote. 
Richelieu had been unable to win Mademoiselle d'Hautefort, and he did his best to embitter the tiff which separated her from the king in 1635. But Louis XIII had learned the charm of confidence and intimacy, and he turned to Louise de Lafayette, a charming girl of seventeen, who was as virtuous as Mademoiselle d'Hautefort, but more gentle and tender than she, and who gave her heart in all guilelessness to that king so powerful, so a-weary, and so melancholy at the very climax of his reign. Happily for Richelieu, he had a means, more certain than even Mademoiselle d'Hautefort's pride, of separating her from Louis XIII mademoiselle de lafayette whilst quite a child had serious ideas of becoming a nun and scruples about being false to her vocation troubled her at court and even in those conversations in which she reproached herself with taking too much pleasure father coussin her confessor who was also the king's sought to quiet her conscience he hoped much from the influence she could exercise over the king but mademoiselle de lafayette feeling herself troubled and perplexed was urgent when the jesuit reported to louis the thirteenth the state of his fair young friend's feelings the king with tears in his eyes replied quote, though i am very sorry she is going away nevertheless i have no desire to be an obstacle to her vocation only let her wait until i have left for the army she did not wait however their last interview took place at the queen's who had no liking for mademoiselle de lafayette and as the king's carriage went out of the courtyard the young girl leaning against the window turned to one of her companions and said quote, alas i shall never see him again End quote but she did see him again often for some time he went to see her in her convent and quote, remained so long glued to her grating says madame de motteville that cardinal richelieu falling a prey to fresh terrors recommenced his intrigues to tear him from her entirely and he succeeded end quote. The king's affection for Mademoiselle d'Hautefort awoke again. She had just rendered the queen an important service. Anne of Austria was secretly corresponding with her two brothers, King Philip IV and the Cardinal Infante, a correspondence which might well make the king and his minister uneasy, since it was carried on through Madame de Chevreuse, and there was war at the time with Spain. The queen employed for this intercourse a valet named Laporte, who was arrested and thrown into prison the chancellor removed to val de grace whither the queen frequently retired he questioned the nuns and rummaged anne of austria's cell she was in mortal anxiety not knowing what laporte might say or how to unloose his tongue so as to keep due pace with her own confessions to the king and the cardinal mademoiselle d'hautefort disguised herself as a servant went straight to the bastille and got a letter delivered to laporte thanks to the agency of commander de jarre his friend then in prison the confessions of mistress and agent being thus set in accord the queen obtained her pardon but not without having to put up with reproaches and conditions of stern supervision madame de chevreuse took fright and went to seek refuge in spain the king's inclination towards mademoiselle d'hautefort revived without her having an idea of turning it to profit on her own account Quote, she had so much loftiness of spirit that she could never have brought herself to ask anything for herself and her family and all that could be wrung from her was to accept what the king and queen were pleased to give her End of section twenty two